going through the book of Matthew as a church this year. We're into chapter 2 now, and we're in this series called It Is Written. See, what Matthew does is when he tells the story of the birth of Jesus, he wraps it around these different prophecies and verses from the Old Testament. And so we looked at week one, the Emmanuel prophecy, this prophecy that the Messiah would signify God with us and how Jesus fulfills that and earns this name because he is God and he is with us. And then last week we looked at the story of the Magi and we looked at how the very birthplace of the Messiah was called ahead of time and how Jesus fulfills this just like he fulfills everything else. And so we're taking a look at the early days of Jesus's life and how none of this is an accident, none of this is a surprise to God, this is all exactly how the plan was supposed to go. And this weekend's verse is a great opportunity to go a little bit deeper with that statement in particular. We're going to start with the passage here in Matthew, then we'll jump back to the Old Testament, and then we're going to hop around all over the place. Uh, And so here it is in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So Matthew quotes a prophet here. It happens to be the prophet Hosea. He's quoting Hosea 11.1. And so we're going to go back and we're going to look at what Hosea wrote because I think this is going to raise some questions. Uh, And so we'll go look at that and we'll, we'll talk about it. So this is the book of Hosea, chapter 11. He writes this. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities, consume the bars of their gates, and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me, and though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. Now, in the beginning of it, you're like, okay, out of Egypt I called my son, that's what Matthew says, cool. And then immediately after that, you're like, wait, what? Were you sacrificing to the Baals? Well, surely that wasn't what Jesus was doing in Egypt. So, what is this about? Like, how does this connect to what Matthew's saying and what Jose? How do those things go together? When you read this in context, it's pretty clear that this is a historical that Hosea is telling the story of the people of Israel and is saying how this, is how this is what God did for them in the past, and now this is what he has for them in the future because of their disobedience. It doesn't seem to be about the Messiah at all. And I would argue that when Hosea wrote this, he had every intention of this being purely historical and speaking to the people of Israel. He did not intend for this to be anything about the Messiah at all. Plain and simple, it's not about anything like that. So how does Matthew take it and attach it to Jesus? How does that work? Now, we've got to be careful how we answer that question because it's going to have implications one way or the other. There is a danger of looking at this passage in Matthew and learning the lesson, oh, So the Old Testament has all of these deeper meanings that we can just dive into and extract somehow. Because then, when you take that perspective, you can take this book and do all sorts of really weird stuff with it. It is literally how cults are formed. So they take a passage go, oh, well, it has this new deeper meaning that was shown to me, and here it is. And it's not what God intended in the first place at all. See, because this is God's Word, we have to be careful with the way that we handle it. Now, 
why are we going in to this on a Sunday morning? Shouldn't this be like a small group or something? I did a small group on this, but look, Bible reading is important. If you're a Christian and you're not regularly reading the Bible, it's like being a guitar player and never tuning your instrument. Right? And now, it's the way that we grow in our faith. It's through this, through engaging with God and His Word. Now look, I'm not up here to tell you that it's not my job to feed you. Jesus didn't tell Peter, if you love me, teach my sheep to self-feed, right? I'm like, No, He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. And of course, that's fine. But if you only ate one meal a week, you're not going to be very healthy. And so we read the Bible, and what it does is it deepens our affections for Christ. It helps us to grow in the knowledge and love and fear of God helps us to grow in his joy. It's important. And so we've got to be careful in the way that we do it. And so I'm going to show you first here some examples of the ways that people have taken this idea that, oh, well, there's deeper meaning for me to extract, and they've done some really wacky things. They've sort of done gymnastics with the Bible. The first one comes from Habakkuk. Book of Habakkuk, one I'm sure you're very, very, very familiar with. Uh, <laughs> Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. He says this, he says, And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Mm, praise God, right? And I say, I've, heard, I've read a lot of people read this passage and think, oh, God's got this plan for me, and I'll tell you what, it's not going to delay, it is surely coming. It may seem slow, but it's... Like, you can preach this, right? Here's the problem. When you read Habakkuk in context, you learn what this vision is that's coming for them. See, the way the book of Habakkuk starts <laughs> is Habakkuk goes, hey, God, how long are you going to punish us for? This has been going on for a long time. The Lord goes, yeah, it's going to keep going for a little while more. And Habakkuk goes... Well, no, that can't be right. That's not like you. This is not your character. You're not going to punish us forever. No, I don't believe it. This isn't happening. And what does the Lord respond? For still the vision awaits its appointed time. If it hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. This is about the judgment that God is bringing on Israel because they've turned away from him. And then people will read it in their own personal reading and go, oh, well, this is about that thing that God's promised me. No, it's really not. The thing that's promised here is destruction. <laughs> and so when you look at it, you're like, oh, God's promised me all these blessings. It's like, well, but maybe, but this verse isn't telling you that. Let's look at another one. It's in Psalm 2. Apparently chapter 2s are good for this. Psalm 2, verse 8. It says, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now this one actually became a pretty popular worship song at one point. Uh, which, because be skeptical of the songs that we sing. Like sometimes we get it wrong, sometimes I get it wrong. And if you notice that and can lovingly point that out, that's, I would be excited, I would be so proud. If someone was like, hey, you said this, or we sung this, and I'm looking at the Bible, and this seems off to me, like, if you could lovingly bring that forward, I would be so proud. If you write an anonymous connection card with that, I'll probably want to give you a wedgie, but <laughs> if, you could, <laughs> if you notice it and you actually like, bring it forward, that would be amazing. Uh, but Hillsong wrote a song called You Said. It goes like this, you said, ask and I'll give the nations to you, O Lord, that's the cry of my heart. The distant shores and the islands would see your light as it rises on us. It crushes for missions week, right? Here's the problem. <laughs> is that immediately after you said, ask, I'll give you the nations as your inheritance, it says you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like pottery. Kind of hurts the vibe we're going for for Mission Sunday there, Right? Sure, God's given the nations to someone. It's to his son to destroy, not for us to go to and preach to. No, this is a good thing. Again, this is a good thing to desire. This is a good thing to pray for. This is a good thing to be excited about. But this is a bad place to find support for that. Let's do one more. 
We won't actually read the passage, because I'm sure everybody is at least relatively familiar with it, but David and Goliath, right? You know the story of David and Goliath. And it gets preached all the time, all over the place. And now I've often, not always, but often heard it preached like this, is that David, he rises to the challenge, he picks up three smooth stones, and he slings them at the giant, and he slays them. And if you just pick up the three smooth stones of faith, love, and tithing, then you can slay the giants in your life. Which is all well and good. It's well-intentioned. But the problem is, that's not what the story's about at all. Now, why am I harping on this? Maybe you're sitting there and you're like, Pastor Jeremy, you're ruining my devotional life. What is happening here? And I certainly felt that way. When I was in Bible college, I'm sitting in an intro to biblical interpretation. And every single class... Dr. Dwight Sheets would stand up there and just not part of the curriculum, but just part of our education, would pull up a verse and go, so what do you think this means? And by the end of the semester, you're like, I'm not answering this question. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so it was sort of a world shaker, like, wait, what? Like, I can't read the Bible that way? Like, that changes everything for me. Well, what do I even do? See... This is important because we stake our lives on this book, literally, right? And so when we use it to do something, to say something that it was never meant to say, then we come away with thinking that God has promised us something that he never promised us. When we don't know how to read Proverbs, for example, Proverbs aren't promises from God, they're just good advice. So when you read Proverbs and you think, well, this is a promise from God, train up a child in the way you should go, and you do everything in your power to train up your kid to follow the Lord, and then they don't, well, if you didn't know that a proverb is not a promise, a proverb is just godly wisdom, well, then you might come away thinking, well, I held up my end of the bargain. God didn't hold up his. He failed me. When God doesn't live up to the thing that he never promised to do, People come away hurt. People come away thinking that God has failed them in some way. They blame him for doing something he never said he was going to do in the first place. And so that's why this is important. So what we've got to do is we've got to look at what these verses meant to the people that wrote them and to the people that first read them. That holds the key for what they mean to us today. Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart wrote an awesome book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And it's what I sort of wrapped a small group around, gosh, two years ago. No, can't believe it's been that long ago. But they sort of help greatly with how do we take this ancient text and bring it into our modern times? It's sort of the question they're answering. And they give a golden rule in the introduction of the book that I think is very helpful in approaching the Bible. And this is it. A text cannot mean what it could never have meant for its original readers and hearers. So a piece of Scripture can't mean anything different from what it meant to the people that read it originally. So something in Matthew, it can't mean anything to us that it wouldn't have meant to the people Matthew was writing to. Make sense? (laughs) No? All right. Well, we'll keep going. So... If you're reading the Bible, you're looking at, well, what does this mean for me? The lesson that you should pull from what you're reading should not be a different lesson than would have been the lesson that the people in 50 AD that Matthew is writing to, that they would have pulled from that text. There's no new mystical hidden things to find, basically. But this does raise a question, though, because it seems like Matthew breaks that rule. Because Matthew takes this Hosea passage that to Hosea's readers did not mean this is the Messiah. To Hosea's readers, this meant this is historical. Matthew takes that and he goes and does something different with it. So why does he do that? What's up with that? Well, I think there are three good reasons why Matthew does this. Number one, Matthew is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's writing the Bible. Which means, if we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, which we do, that the Holy Spirit can tell Matthew to do whatever he wants to. It's the Holy Spirit. He's got that kind of clout, right? He can break the rules. And so Matthew may be breaking the rules here, which we'll get to. I don't necessarily think he is. 
But he's doing it under the guise of the Holy Spirit. Not under the guise. He's doing it under the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired Hosea to write what he wrote. And the Holy Spirit is inspiring Matthew to write what he's writing here. Second thing is that Jesus showed two of the disciples specifically that the entirety of Scripture speaks about him and showed them all the places where it does. It's in Luke. Uh, Luke 24, 27. It says, In beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. Like To be a, a fly on the wall of that conversation, right? Where he goes through and just breaks down, here's everywhere that I am in the Old Testament. Amazing. And he shows two of them, and it's reasonable to conclude that that's where the teaching in the early church comes from, is them looking at those passages that Jesus showed them and unpacking them for everybody else. The second thing is that Jesus declared that all of the scriptures are ultimately about him. In John chapter 5, 39, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you, may, you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And so Jesus sort of confronts the Pharisees here that, look, here's the irony, is that you're digging through the scriptures because you think life is there, but that book is about me, and you're missing me when I'm right in front of your face. See, the entire Bible is ultimately about Jesus. He's the key that unlocks everything. So the Bible is not about us. The Bible is about Jesus. When we understand this, this changes the way we see everything that we're reading. The every passage we can look at in the light of Jesus. So let's go back to Habakkuk 2. This wrath is coming, it's certain. Well, how do we see this through the light of Jesus? Well, God's wrath is certain, and it is deserved by everyone, not just Israel. And Jesus steps in and intercepts it. He doesn't step in and tell God, hey, maybe we should reconsider. God's sense of justice, his sense of holiness can't allow that, but Jesus steps in and takes the penalty for us. That wrath that's coming that was not going to delay, that it may seem slow, but trust him, it's on the way. Jesus steps in and takes that from us. He stands in our place. He takes the punishment that we were due. And so we can be sure of salvation because it's in Christ that he gives that to us because he stepped in in our place. Psalm 2, what do we do? how do we see that in the light of Jesus? All nations are going to bow before Jesus someday. In Romans 14, 11, Paul writes, As I live, it says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. He is the Son who will break every nation. He is the Son who all kings that serve themselves will one day serve. Everything and everyone is due Jesus. Let's go back to David and Goliath. The key problem here is not necessarily that we insert ourselves into the biblical stories. The problem is we put ourselves in the wrong roles in the biblical stories. You are not David. I'm not David. You know who we are? We're Israel. And we're standing on the sidelines watching Jesus fight the battle that we were too incapable of fighting ourselves and watching him slay the giant of sin that we could never slay for ourselves. It's Jesus, the good shepherd, who can defeat the giant, who can fight the battle for us and give us the victory that we didn't even earn. I don't know about you, but I get way more excited looking at passages in that light. Like, I get way more fired up about that. And so maybe you're wondering, like, well, how do I do this? How do I start seeing things this way? Uh, there's a great book to help you find Jesus in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, even in some uh, books. And uh, it's this. It's called How to Read the Bible Through the Jesus Lens by Michael Williams, which I'd highly recommend. It gives you about four pages on each book of the Bible. And it goes through and it shows you, it gives you a little overview, and then it shows you sort of, here's where you can see Jesus in this book. Um, You might notice it looks very similar to the How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth book, because they're made by the same people. Uh, This is an awesome, awesome resource. It's like 15, 16 bucks on Amazon. Uh, Super helpful addition to your library. 
If you're looking into doing serious Bible study, I totally recommend this one. But see, what Matthew's doing here is he's not saying, okay, Hosea said this, and now here it has all of these new meanings that I've uncovered. What I think Matthew's doing is he's seeing a pattern. He's going, huh, how about that? So God's chosen people go to Egypt and spend some time there, and then they come out of Egypt, and he leads them to the promised land. And it just so happens that the Messiah goes to Egypt and spends some time there and comes out. What he's doing is he's recognizing patterns. He's seeing types. He's knowing, okay, look, God is sovereign. There are no coincidences. So the fact that this happens, it's not a coincidence. God's showing us something here. And he sees this verse that very concisely says, look, I called my son out of Egypt. He goes, yeah, it's kind of like how Jesus gets called out of Egypt, how he spends time there too. And so he's doing some things, he's developing some new theological themes. Remember the video we watched at the beginning of the series, if you were here, if not, you can find it on our website, where it sort of breaks down, it's got the animation, it breaks down Matthew. It shows these are all the things that Jesus is sort of replacing uh, in a way. He's the new Abraham, he's the new David, and what? He's the new Moses, who goes to Egypt. The child who is rescued ends up in Egypt and comes out of Egypt to save God's people. You can see it on the banner out in the lobby. And so we've got Matthew here, he wants us to see Jesus as this better version of Moses that's coming. And even that Jesus is a better Israel, period. The people of God are now defined by him, not by anything else. And so chapter 1, we saw the new Genesis, right? This is the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ. Now here's how the Genesis of Jesus came to be. Matthew drops these things in. There's this new creation that's happening. And then here in chapter 2, we get the new Exodus. But what can we learn from this passage then, though? Like, does this have anything to say to us, or is it just this kind of neat little theological aside? I think this actually has a lot to say to us. There are two pretty big lessons, and the first is that God's plans are unstoppable. Herod plans to kill Jesus through sneak attack. He knows, who, he knows where he is, he knows about how old he is, and so he figures, all right, I can easily go in, take him out. Seems like this child is doomed. But God intervenes. His plan's not going to be thwarted by Herod. His plan's not going to be thwarted by anybody else. He's in control here. Sure, Jesus came to die. But on his own terms, when he says so, there's a bunch of times where people try to kill Jesus that he doesn't let them. In uh, John chapter 8, so, so the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. In John, Jesus just seems to on purpose rile up the Pharisees constantly. And he does it again here when he claims to know Abraham, who's thousands of years dead by this point. And they're like, really? You know Abraham? You're not even 50. And he goes, well, yeah, because I'm God. And then let's stone him, and he just hides. He like ducks away. You don't picture Jesus like sneaking out of the temple, but this is what happens here. Why? Because it's not the time. There's another instance where this happens. is When they heard this thing, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So they're going to drive Jesus to this cliff and just throw him off a cliff. And he just, just walks right through. I don't even know how that's possible. Like how, it's like one of those cartoons where the animals are fighting, right? And it's like the cloud of dust, and then one person just walks out of the cloud of dust, but the cloud keeps going as the person is beating himself up or something. Like, I don't know if that's what this looked like or what this was. But they, they go to kill Jesus, and he just, he's out of there. Why? Well, he explains it, actually, in John chapter 10. He says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus goes, look, I came to die, but not, you're not killing me. Let's be clear about this. 
But I'm only here to die because I'm laying down my life. You're not taking it from me. I'm giving it to you. So it's Jesus who determines when he dies. Nobody else. And so God is ultimately in control of everything that's happening here. No one's going to stop this plan. No one's going to get in the way. He does whatever he wants. This may be a hard truth, but this is a deeply biblical truth. That God does whatever he wants to do, period. End of discussion. Psalm 115, verse 2. It says, Who, why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Where is our God? Well, he's everywhere doing whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, period. Even you see a guy in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, not a Jew, not a good follower of God. He gets it. He says, in the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? He does what he wants and no one can challenge him. Well, why did you do this? Because I wanted to. And he owes us nothing more than that. Because he's God and he can do what he wants. Who am I to say, hey, you're doing this wrong? He's the one who created everything. I saw this post online that cracked me up where there was this article that was going around and it was inspiring all of this debate. I think it was in like tech circles. And this guy's got this dramatic, like bold take on this, serving up the hot takes. And he says something and this woman replies to him and says, well, actually, that's not what the article, that's not what the writer meant when they wrote the article. You've, you've got, you're misunderstanding this part. So, of course, he lashes out at her and is, well, how would you know, blah, blah, blah. He just goes off on her. And then, and you probably know where this is going, she responds, well, I wrote the article, so I think I know. Crack me up. See, there was no one better to understand what the article meant than the person that wrote the article. There's no one better to understand what's going on here than the person that created it all. No one can stop him. No one can rightly question him. He does what he wants. Job says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job replying to God, summing up what God has just said. Job, you get just... Paragraph, chapter after chapter of bad theology, of his friends just blowing it completely, telling him all sorts of crazy things. And finally, God shows up at the end and just lays the smack down. And Job comes to that conclusion, look, you can do whatever you want. In a word, God is sovereign. This means he does what he wants, always. That he's never stopped from doing what he wants to do. Never. Arthur Pink wrote the classic treatise on this back in 1918. And it's amazing how you read these words that are now almost exactly 100 years old, and they still just pack such a punch. He says this in the beginning of his book, The Sovereignty of God. He says, The conception of deity which prevails most widely today, even among those who profess to give heed to the Scriptures, is a miserable character, a blasphemous travesty of the truth, The God of the 20th century is a helpless, effeminate being who commands the respect of no really thoughtful man. Laying a smack down for a guy named Pink. He's getting it done. And now, so Matthew has seemingly sucked all the drama out of the story here because he's saying right from the jump, God does whatever he wants. He's in control here. He's running the show. Don't get it twisted. And also, I mean, we know how the story ends. Presumably, you're not going to start this book and then have the main character die in the first, like, chapter or two. Unless you're, like, writing the movie Psycho and the woman gets stabbed in the shower, like, 40 minutes in. Like, you don't... That's not usually how you do this. Spoilers for a 60-year-old movie, I guess. Um, But Matthew's also sowing seeds of God's sovereignty already throughout the book. We've seen it with the genealogy. Look. 
He's pointing out, look how God worked through history. He organized all of this to bring us here to Jesus. And then we see it with the Emmanuel prophecy. The God with us in the same way that now Jesus is here. And he literally is God and he's literally with us. He's fulfilled this completely. And then we see it with the Magi coming right to Bethlehem, right where he directed them to go. And now we see it here. So Herod thinks he's going to ruin God's plan. Good luck with that. If God can't be stopped, though, then that kind of changes the way that we view Joseph's role in this whole thing, right? He's not, the sa- he's not saving Jesus. See, God didn't need Joseph. He allows Joseph to be part of the plan. God doesn't need him, but he allows him to be part of what he's doing here. Paul writes this, or says this, in the book of Acts. It says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he gives himself, he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Because look, God gives us everything. He doesn't need anything. Paul says this in Athens when he's surrounded by false gods. Literally, they're all, all these gods, yeah, they needed you to carve them out of stone. How powerful are they really? All these other false gods, they need men to defend them because apparently they can't stick up for themselves. I was like, that's weak. God doesn't need anything from anyone. He is all sufficient in himself. What he does is he allows us to serve him, not because we're doing him a favor. He allows us to serve him for our joy. He doesn't need you to accomplish the mission, but he allows you to be a part of it. It's like a mother and her five-year-old daughter in the kitchen, right? And the daughter is, you know, takes, has a cup of already measured ingredients that she turns into the pot. Mother doesn't need her. She already cut the vegetables. She measured them out. She put the cup in the daughter's hand, watched her very carefully as she turned it in to the pot. She, she's not doing this because she needs help in the kitchen. If anything, this is making it way more complicated and way more difficult. She's doing this to share her joy and to share her love with her daughter. And so God created you to experience him. He created you to share his love and his joy and his beauty with you. And so he graciously allows us the joy of participating in the things that he does. Like, I say from time to time, and we say during the offering here, he doesn't want something from you, he wants something for you. That's why we say that. And so we've got to realize that when we're serving God, we're not doing him a favor. The starting place of serving the Lord is realizing that we can't help him at all. That's where it begins. That he can help and give to us, but we have nothing to offer him. That he didn't already give us in the first place. Look, the army won't take you unless you're healthy. Jesus won't take you unless you're sick. Starting place is realizing that, look, I I got nothing to offer him, but he's going to allow me to be a part of this. On Craigslist, there are two kinds of ads for goods and services, for like services that you find. There are jobs and gigs ads, and there are services ads. Jobs and gigs are things posted by people needing something done. Either it's a long-term job, or maybe it's just a one-night gig, something like that. They're looking for talent to accomplish something they want to do. Services are people where you say, hey, look, I'm a graphic designer. I design things. Here's my portfolio. Anybody needs any graphic design, I'll be over here. The gospel is way more like the latter than the former. It's not God saying, hey, I need some help here. It's him going, look what I can do for you. And so when we serve God, when we follow him, when we give him our obedience, when we give him our money, when we give him our time, whatever it is, we're not giving anything, we're receiving. Paul writes that God gives us both the will to serve him and the strength to do it. 
It's in Philippians 2, verse 13. It says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So he's the one who gives you both the desire and the ability to do the things that he's called you to do. Because it's for you, it's not for him. See, we do these things and we get joy. There's tremendous joy to be had in him. You want to be a happier person? Do more, give more, serve more. It'll come. We do the right things for the right reasons. It produces joy, always. And when we serve him, God gets the glory. Why? Because it's already his. Whenever we try to take it, we're not beating him to it. It's not a loose ball where the first person to get it has possession. It's a steal. We're taking something from the person it belongs to. See, when we give God glory, when we serve him in the right way, we, we enter into this dance of God that's been happening forever, this exchange of love and joy and peace that's been happening between all three members of the Trinity from time's beginning. It's distributed with no end in sight, and we become recipients of it when we give. We enter into that. All the promises of God become ours. We receive when we give. And so what I think we can walk away from this passage with is an understanding of God's power. He's unstoppable. He does whatever he wants, and he's on our team. You guys know what that's like as Packers fans, right? <laughs> Having one player that's dominant that just can take over, that you can trust. We don't know that in Cleveland, right? <laughs> <laughs> Stacy King was a uh, guard for the Chicago Bulls back in the 90s. And one night, Michael Jordan scored a career-high 69 points against the Cleveland Cavaliers, of course. Wasn't as crazy about Mike as everybody else was my age back then. But he gave a quote in the locker room. It's one of the all-time great quotes in NBA history. He said, I'll always remember this as the night that Michael Jordan and I combined to score 70 points. <laughs> We're on the side of the almighty, all-powerful king of the universe. And we get to watch him reign and rule and cheer him on as it happens. We get to take our joy from it as it happens. And look, I understand this is a hard doctrine. And you think long and hard about this enough, and it raises questions. Trust me, it does. I'm not going to say that it doesn't. But I will tell you this, is that when disaster strikes, nothing else holds weight. Nothing else holds up beyond this. I just spent two days in bed because I couldn't get out because my head hurt so bad. But, I know that I don't serve some ineffectual God that, gee, he really wishes he could help me, but something's standing in his way and he just can't. I know that I serve the all-powerful creator of the universe who everything that I go through is designed by him with my best interest at heart. Even when I don't understand it, even when it's painful, even when I don't know what it means, it's for my benefit. And that's where comfort is to be found when the wheels fall off. That he's in control. And so, this should inspire us to serve him, to put our faith in him, to put our trust in him, to make him the center of our lives, the place we find our joy. This should inspire us to follow him, to do what he's called us to do, because it's just for our benefit that we do it. He doesn't need it. He's given you these tasks. He's given you these abilities. He's given you this call for you. It's not for him. And it should inspire us to trust the one who rules all, who controls all, and works everything out for the good of those who love him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we can trust you. We can know that you are in control. That you have everything working according to your plan. And that when we don't understand it, when we don't know why we go through the things we go through, that we can still always fall back on knowing that you 
are at the wheel. You have control and you are doing everything that you want to do. Lord, help us to find our joy in that. Help us to find our refuge in that. Help us to trust you. Lord, give us faith. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.